Sacred Heart is proud to sponsor Pensacola Histories in recognition of the Daughters of Charity who brought their mission of care to Pensacola over 90 years ago. Hello and welcome to our stories of Pensacola, North America's first settlement. In our previous two se uh, sessions, we've talked about the beginnings of an idea for the Spanish government to create a, a control of North America. And we've talked about early explorers of, right, like Ponce de Leon and Cabeza de Vaca, Hernando de Soto. And then, of course, the beginnings of the Spanish concept of a whole armada, a task force to control the continent by settlement using a task force led by Don Tristan de Luna y Arellano with 1,500 people who left Mexico and Mexico, the coast of Mexico on the 17th day of July in 1,559. And that's where we left our story last time, and this is where we pick up today. It's the evening of the 17th of July, and de Luna and Gomez Arias, the admiral, are seated enjoying dinner in the uh, great cabin of the Estramadura, and they're sailing on. And naturally, de Luna's asked the, the admiral, how long is it going to take us to make this voyage? And, and the admiral said, well, in, with all decent winds, it should take 10 days, maybe 12. We should certainly be there at Oshus. Well, the winds were not decent. And the first of them that picked up blew the fleet clear across the Caribbean. They went almost to where Tampa Bay is today. And then, of course, the winds changed. They blew them back almost again, almost to the coast of Mexico. And this went on a third time. And finally, after almost a month, they are finally sailing along the, what we today call the Panhandle and approaching Pensacola or Oshus. And wouldn't you know it, in the night, with the darkness and all, they sailed right by the rather narrow entrance to Pensacola Bay. The next morning, they woke up opposite a, the entrance to a bay and thought they had arrived. But of course, when they entered, they realized that by the descriptions they had had from the earlier explorers, this was not it. They were in what we would today call Mobile. Now, we must rec recognize that in the course of all of this putting together of the assembly, we not only had 1,550 people, we had all of the farm am animals, domestic animals, that were necessary to establish three different settlements. You had, of course, the, the 200 cavalry horses, and then you had cows and pigs and goats and all of the things that you needed. So basically, cramming all of those elements along with 1,550 people into those 13 ships. This, this was not exactly what you'd call your typical carnival cruise. It was a very uncomfortable thing, particularly for the women and children. So when they reached Mobile Bay, De Luna, the compassionate leader, elected to say, all right, we're, we're going to put the horses and the cavalry off here. We're going to disembark them. You can march those last 60 miles back, and we'll at least make it comfortable for the ladies on the last leg of the journey. And they did. They set sail, and the next morning, this is now the 14th day of August in 1559, the 13 vessels enter Pensacola Bay, they sail to the east, and they come to anchor right up opposite what we call the bluffs. Now, the, the stories that we have in the various journals pretty well document that the, the choice of the, of the anchorage was there to protect any fleet and any, any vessels anchored there from nor severe north winds. And so they anchored, and the very first thing that DeLuna did was to have himself, the seven friars, other leaders of the expedition, rowed ashore, they climbed the, the bluffs, and this is where we believe the first religious service conducted by clergy was held here in North America. They gave thanks for their safe crossing. This was literally a service of thanksgiving. And then they were they prepared to go back aboard ship to do take care of the next step. Now, if, if they had operated strictly by the book in the army terms, the next thing that would have happened was arrangements would have been in, in place immediately for the next morning to begin the offloading of all of the materials from the ships. But De Luna, the compassionate man, said, no, wait a minute. These people, have, particularly the women, they've gone through a very miserable time. We're going to let them all come ashore, and we're going to give them three days of rest and relaxation. Let them splash around in the water. Let them see the beautiful trees. Let them see their new home, what it'll be like. And then on the fourth day, we will start to unload. Now, what we will do, we'll take the smallest ship that we've got here. We'll bring it in. We will unload that now and send it back to, to Mexico right now so that the, uh, the Viceroy will know that, indeed, we have uh, arrived safely, even though we're, we're a little bit late. Now, Juan Serran Saavedra, De Luna's second in command, went to his commander and he said, Now, no, sir, I, I don't like to be, uh, to be a, 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 an opposition here, but, you know, by the book, we should start to unload. And De Luna said, no, we are going to take care of the people. That is part of my commission. And indeed, that's what they did. And so for the next three days, rest and relaxation, R&R, &R, 
prevailed. Then the people had a wonderful time. They were seeing what their new home was like. They could frolic under the trees. And of course, they were seeing these beautiful, handsome pine trees that were there. Everyone was having a wonderful time. And we're on the, on the evening now of the last day of rest and relaxation. And once again, De Luna is together with Gomez Arias, the admiral, in the, in the, in the ship's cabin, having a nice dinner, getting ready for the, for the, debar, uh, the de, uh, unloading of the vessels next day. And about this time, about eight o'clock, they begin to hear the pitter-patter of rain against the bulkhead. And immediately, De Luna says, uh, Admiral, if you don't mind, I'd like to have my, have my uh, if you will, have me rowed ashore. Uh, a good commander should not be here in the comforts of your cabin. I should be with the people. Because after all, there is no holiday inn here taking care of these people on shore. They're under the trees. They're exposed to the elements. Please row me ashore. And they did. Well, by 9 o'clock, it's raining pretty hard. By 10 o'clock, the wind has come up very strong. And by midnight, well, it is, from all of the reports, they were going through what we would today call either a Category 4 or Category 5 storm. Now, I will tell you that when I read the first account of this, which is, by the way, is recorded in what is known as the Luna Papers, it's a kind of a transcript of all that happened in the wake of the, of the expedition itself. I read the account of the storm and what happened next, and frankly, I did not believe it. I had been, my wife and I had been in Pensacola for some time. We'd been through several hurricanes. We had seen nothing terrible about that. But when Hurricane Ivan came in, in, in 2004, I became a believer that the Luna Papers were right. Because what we saw on the 16th of September 2004 was a terrible, terrible wreckage of the community. And that is exactly what took place with the De Luna expedition and its people all under the trees. All night long, this terrible storm raged. And when, the, when dawn came and the winds subsided, uh, of course, the, the survivors rose up and quickly began to look around to see what they had. And they, it was an absolute disaster. There were scores of people who had been killed by falling branches, falling trees. Many, many others had been injured. And of course, immediately, the friars, all of whom uh, survived, and many of the women began to put together what we would today call an aid station, an emergency room. But of course, all of the supplies that they might have had had been left on the ships. They had nothing to work with except their, their hands and perhaps some fresh water. They did this as quickly as they could, and they were working frantically to try and free people who had been trapped. And then suddenly someone said, wait a minute, what about the ships? And immediately, De Luna and his, his two or three of the leaders rushed down to the, to the edge of the bluffs and looked over uh, what, over the edge of the bay. And of course, when, they, when, when De Luna had been rowed, rowed ashore, there were 12 vessels there. And now, all they could see was boxes and barrels, garbage, wreckage, bodies. There was not a single ship's mast to be seen. They were all gone. And one can imagine what began to go through the mind of poor Tristan De Luna. Here he was with the survivors of 1,550 people and all of the supplies that were to take care of them for the next two years were gone. Well, immediately, of course, they began, they continued their work of uh, caring for the ill and the injured and looking around to, uh, at first to see what they might do to eat. And then late in the afternoon, they had one small piece of good luck. At that point in time, another ship, a small one, came into sight from the east and landed. Now, the commander of that vessel had had the good sense to cut his cable when the storm began. He had been blown east, had been blown aground, but now with the high tide, he had been floated free and he was back. The, the ship had been badly damaged, but it was serviceable. And as a result of that, they quickly unloaded what was, what was uh, uh, salvageable there and the message was rushed back now to Mexico. Uh, I say rushed, well, this is a 15th, 16th century vessel, but they went as quickly as they could to bring the bad news saying, please help us, we, must, we are now devastated, we are without supply. And of course, Juan Saran Saavedra, who had been the, the lieutenant colonel in charge of gathering all the supplies, had the, the very bad thoughts in his own mind that he and his, his team had literally stripped the warehouses of all of Mexico to provide what was put on the vessels for De Luna. So he knew there was precious little that could be gathered and sent as a resupply. But nonetheless, people immediately began to do what, what you and I might do today. They, they formed committees. One committee was put in charge of saying, what can we, what can we do, uh, what can we get to eat out of the bay? Shellfish, fish of all kinds. And these were Spanish people, uh, seafaring people. You would have thought that they would have found all that they needed in the bay. But some unusual circumstance, probably 
through the storm, uh, rend rendered their efforts to, to fish almost n to nothing. They got, they could, over the next two years, they could find very little to eat from the bay. And of course, others went out into the forest. Could we find uh, edible fruits and uh, anything that would grow out there, berries? And once again, those who live in this area today know that uh, they are, are, much as we love our forests, they do, do not necessarily bring forth a lot of natural food and consequently they had little to, to work with. And so now De Luna was faced with the next possibility. One, one of the reports that he had had for, uh, that had come from the, the, the survivors of the DeSoto expedition had spoken not only of the Central Coosa tribe, but also of the satellites which that tribe had. And one of these satellites, which was named Nana Capana, was said to be on a large river not far from Oshus and about 60 miles to the north. Well, that was all the information they had. No map, no, nothing more, more uh, certain than that. So immediately, De Luna brought about 30 members of the cavalry together, led by Major Del Saus, and their order was, see if you can find Nana Campana. Perhaps there might be food there that would serve us at least for a while. Now, put yourself in Major Del Sao's position. He had no map. He simply began to go west, and every time they came to a stream of any size, they would go north until it was obvious that that was not the right place. Then they would move west again, and it took them better than two and a half months. But finally, by some almost a miracle, they did find the village of Nana Capana. It once upon a time had been a large village, but it was now much shrunk, uh, although there was a food supply there. Uh, the, the absence of large numbers of uh, populace, of course, probably came from the fact that the Indians may have been affected by white men's diseases that had been brought in by the DeSoto uh, expedition. Whatever the reason, this village was small, but it was there and there was food. So quickly, uh, Del Sao sent back a messenger saying, it is here. Now, if you think these surviving people can walk across the, the rivers, across the, the swamps, across the briar, and get to this 70 or 80 miles north, fine. It's here. And so immediately De Luna gave the order, tomorrow we will march. And the, what they did, of course, some of the women, some of the friars remained behind to care for the ill and the injured. The balance started marching north and west. Well, it, didn't, it wasn't an easy march. You can imagine what it would be today, walking 65 or 70 miles that way. But indeed, finally, they did reach Nanakapana. The Indians were friendly. They settled in. And there was, obviously, a, a modest amount of food, but certainly nothing like what they would need to care for them throughout the entire winter. And so the second decision was made. Now, uh, De Luna ordered Major Del Salles with the whole of the 200 cavalrymen to march and try to find Kusa. Now, once again, this is, this is a needle in a haystack. They have no idea where they're going, except that it, it probably is east somewhere from where they are sitting now. And so on a given morning, the 200 cavalrymen set forth. By the way, they, they sent all the cavalry, the whole of, of the cavalry group, because, of course, horses eat too. And they didn't want to leave anyone behind that would consume more of the food that they had, which was in such limited supply. Well, Del Saos marched forward. He, he went here. He went there. It went week after week. And finally, and this is, again, this is almost one of those miracles of our story. Finally, they did find Kusa. And the, the chief who reigned then remembered the, the, the presence there of uh, Hernando de Soto and had a, a warm memory of it. And so he welcomed Del Saos and the friars that were with him and said, settle in, let's, let's be friends. And of course, uh, uh, Del Saos and the friar of Domingo de Santo Domingo were smart enough not to quickly spring on the chief the idea that they wanted to bring eight or 900 people here for the winter. They, were, they realized that they had to develop a relationship before that could happen. And so step by step by step, the these groups began to get acquainted and to make friends. And that's basically the way things stood at the end of about 30 days, and our fourth episode will tell the balance of that story.